Uh, welcome back to our, our third session for this Documenting COVID-19 um, Symposium at the National Archives of Australia. And without further ado, I'm going to call upon Dr. Daniel Angus, the Associate Professor of Digital Communication and Leader of the Computational Communication and Culture Program in Queensland University of Technology's world-leading digital media research centre. Over to you, Daniel. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here today um, to talk to you about um, some of what we've been doing here at QUT, uh, particularly across the Digital Media Research Centre and uh, our Digital Observatory. Um, so where I want to start is talking about an initiative that spans back to 2014, um, which is what we call the Australian Twitter Sphere. So what the Australian Twitter Sphere is, is a project that's involved a number of stakeholders across Australia, um, and it's a longitudinal curated collection of tweets from approximately about half a million Twitter accounts that were identified as being Australian accounts uh, back in 2016. So this means that they list themselves geographically as being located in Australia, or they've been posting content which might signify that they are indeed uh, Australian citizens or residing in Australia uh, for some period of time. This was initiated um, through a LEAF grant um, in 2014 to 16 by uh, a very good colleague and, and collaborator here in the Digital Media Research Centre, Professor Axel Bruns. Um, and it's been supported internally by QT through our Digital Observatory since about 2017. Um, now, this collection um, that we have is, is quite substantial in size. It, it contains billions of tweets from as far back as 2006, um, but we have a complete um, and lasting collection since 2018 of the accounts that we've identified as, as Australian. Um, and there's some exciting plans ahead for this, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, as we've just received some funding from the Australian Research Data Commons to support the growth of this platform into a national uh, level observatory. But what we did during the pandemic is, is quite interesting because we, we're a bit unique in the sense that the, not every jurisdiction has access to this kind of a resource, like a national level archive of social media data. Social media, as we all know, is, is kind of very much in the hands of the platforms and, um, and these are commercial entities, not necessarily public entities. Um, and so what we post there is, as citizens, as ordinary um, people, is, is very much commercial in, in some way. Um, and there's very interesting copyright around that as well and, and kind of who owns this, is it the user, is it the platform, um, is there some kind of public right to this information. Um, and so what we thought to do was, was to think about, well, in this moment, this very critical kind of uh, moment in time is to collect um, tweets or, or identify tweets in our collections that were somehow um, talking about the, the coronavirus pandemic. So we looked at tweets from the, about the 20th of January up until the 3rd of May, mentioning text that we'd identified as perhaps being adjacent to uh, the pandemic itself. Um, so a list of some of that um, is included here on the slide. COVID as a, as a strict um, word, uh, COVID slash 19 or COVID slash 19 AU, you know, any of those variations were included. Um, in doing this, um, we amassed a collection, a sub collection within our larger national tweets. And it, it must be said that these are only tweets from those identified within our national corpus. This is not every single tweet necessarily sent by an Australian um, on Twitter in that particular period, just the ones that we've identified and that we have some record of, which is a fairly comprehensive sample, um, I will say. Um, some key takeaways from this in analysing this through various analytics and, and other computational methods is that you know, we find particular themes and trends occurring in that time. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of Twitter users urging governments for uh, measures to shut down parts of the country from, you know, as far back as the start of March and very much preempting any kind of government intervention um, to do that at a state or indeed federal level. Um, and a lot of users turning to medical experts for information, while governments were not necessarily, uh, necessarily as forthcoming um, with expertise at the time. Um, and so that kind of void or that, that vacancy of information, particularly on a, on a very kind of personal level, taken up by um, these medical experts who were very popular on the platform and, and seen as um, being useful in terms of you know, putting out practical advice and, and meaningful medical advice, um, particularly those adjacent with um, 
you know, the ABC and other uh, peak news organizations. And when they included links, users were overwhelmingly sharing links to news stories. So still central news within our, um, I guess, our social media diets, the linking to authoritative and, and traditional news sources as well. Um, we generated a visualization of this to make this data, I guess, more um, visible and, and usable in, in the hands of the, the wider public and indeed to kind of signal, I guess, to um, civil society and to other academics that we have this capacity and we're there to kind of help. Um, we want to see the, this kind of data be used for informing research, for forming part of this historical memory of, you know, what kind of went down during the pandemic. And so we did this, uh, this little kind of visualization with our colleagues in the visual and e-research team here at QT to visualize some of the themes and, and who was mentioned and what was linked to. So this is just one screenshot of that um, showing some of the dominant themes. Um, you can see stay home, social distancing, flatten the curve, all kind of as, as themes that come and maybe wane in the, in the latter part. Interestingly, words that have um, persisted to even today, um, things like COVID safe, don't really emerge until later in this, this first 100 days around the end of April, which is quite interesting. So where to from here is that what with this particular data set, we've, we've um, deposited it up on the ARDC's research data um, finder. Um, it has a DOI. We can't publish the full text of all of the tweets on a resource like this. And this is part of this interesting tension between the commercial logics of the platforms, what we can do as, as scientists and as um, academics. Um, so what we've done in this particular instance is identify the unique tweet IDs and we've, we've made them available as a long list of those IDs. So we've done the work of curation of those IDs, but anyone who downloads this data would then have to actually reconstitute that data set from Twitter itself. Part of that, that kind of, I guess, that brokering of access with these platforms are these often, you know, some halfway measures between, you know, what we can do and what we're permitted to do within the legal bounds and the terms of service um, of the platforms themselves. So I guess I'll finish there and I'll just wrap up with just a couple of thoughts for that, that that reflect some of the themes of the day is that I think with digital media and social media, I've given the example here of Twitter, we, we're embarking on research across not just Twitter data sets um, pertaining to the pandemic and other important social issues, but also on Facebook, on Instagram, on, on many of the large social media platforms. Of critical concern for us is the ephemeral nature of this data. And as you can see, this is one attempt to try and make a lasting record of what I think and, and many of the researchers here believe are very important um, public conversations that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. The concern that we have is that because of the a lot of these platforms exist in this commercial realm, there's no real impetus for them to create lasting records of this, of this data. And in fact, no matter, you know, if something was to happen to say one of those platforms, the switch could get pulled overnight and we'd be left with no data whatsoever. And so it's a, a significant concern for us that there are attempts like this um, where we do um, look in ways and, and, and trying to skirting around those legal issues or, or coming up with creative solutions to try and do this work of archive of this ephemeral um, data, but also doing so in a way, I guess, that responds to issues of privacy, of the right to be forgotten, and the fact that this is user-generated data. And so we have to be cognizant of that fact as much as anything, that, you know, users who are posting there are doing it in a semi-public way. Um, it's not fully public in the sense that they might imagine that their data is going to be the subject of some detailed analysis. They've not necessarily consented to that. And so it kind of sits in this semi-public space space where they realize perhaps that, yes, it is open, anyone can find it, but how likely it is that it will become maybe the center of a lot of attention um, is another question entirely. But I'll leave it there and um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was most illuminating. I think some of those uh, keywords you've got there help us start to think about frameworks and, and themes that we can start to explore across the wider documentary heritage uh, landscape as well. I think that's a, a visualisation particularly was very, very telling. Thank you so much for your contribution. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tehi Nomiko Fuller, who is Senior Lecturer in Digital Humanities at the Australian National University and member of the Australian Government Linked Data Working Group, a Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Data in Haste Virtual Laboratory Champion at eResearch South Australia 
and a 2016 Fellow at the Software Sustainability Institute in the United Kingdom. Over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I would like to just begin by saying that it's a huge honor to be here today and to hear from all these amazing people whose opinions I agree with, so that's nice. Um, thank you to all the organizers, to Adrian, and to uh, the Memory of the World Committee for giving me this opportunity because I am delighted to be here. Um, I guess I have some slides, okay, great. So my tasks here today is to talk about the challenges of documenting COVID-19 from the digital humanities perspective. Fantastic. So, what does documenting the, the COVID crisis from a digital humanities perspective, what does that look like? Well, we, that is to say, digital humanities researchers and scholars, we examine the world from the combined perspectives, and I say this with zero hyperbole, the entirety of human effort and endeavor in all of history ever, and computational tools. Well, two, two big fields. Um, we, we, amongst all of this, we examine human behavior online, and, and then there are things like my personal passions, which lie in examining the ways in which our own views of the world influence information retrieval and knowledge representation. That is to say, I love looking at the ways in which the way that we view the world affects the databases that we design, but also the way that we choose to access and retrieve information from those knowledge structures. Um, a key feature of digital humanities research is that we recognize a certain inevitabilities uh, about data. Um, so there will be inevitably a proliferation of data about the COVID crisis. There will be data, there will be data sets, the changes to funding organization stipulations will mean that a greater number of projects focusing on the pandemic will have been submitted and will have been successful. The focus of ethics clearance bodies means that projects that wanted to look at the COVID crisis are more likely to have given president in terms of getting ethics clearance, so they have had more time, energy investment into, into being able to create their data. So these scientific data sets will undoubtedly represent various different granular granularities of scale but also temporality. So we're going to have diachronic studies that operate at the level of an entire nation, but we're also going to have snapshots in time that capture the life of an individual living through the crisis. And we will undoubtedly hear terms and ideas like big data, and open data, and my personal favorite, linked data, uh, touted as possible solutions and approaches. But I would like to observe and assert that it's not so much the big of the data that's important, but that it's complex. If I was to crack a crude joke, I would say it's not the size of your data set that matters, etc., etc. But I'm gonna let that go because this gets recorded. Um, so yes, but luckily for me and for us in digital humanities, we are very familiar with complicated data. Click to change slide. Um, so, in many ways, I think the key is not just in documenting explicit data sets from science, medicine, uh, of policy development, or public information dissemination. What I think is really of essential importance is to collect and record the socio-cultural ephemera of our times. So, in many ways, I think that the incidental data snippets that capture the mundane are an extremely valuable and important part of creating a full and comprehensive picture of life during the pandemic. This means things like, can photos of meals published on Instagram tell us about how our diets have changed during lockdown? Can the real-time analysis of lengthy posts on Reddit help highlight subtle signs of suicide ideation in individuals who are struggling with complicated grief? Can we model previous pandemics with the option of reinterpreting the data by changing one of several unknown variables? The lockdown has also increased things like online gaming. Can data from video game strategies be used to model 
real-world crime syndicate behavior? These are the sorts of questions that my students are currently working on. There are, of course, other areas of investigation that we haven't even had a chance to touch yet. Um, so, you know, could Twitter serve as the platform to record the chorus of a million academics lamenting at another lecture delivered to a wall of turned off cameras? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's my Twitter feed right now. Um, should we keep records of bored teenagers in lockdown sexting each other on Snapchat? Um, what can those videos on TikTok that didn't become viral tell us about our modern society and its values? And in all this, I haven't even touched upon platforms that are popular beyond the Anglophone world, such as uh, Sina Weibo or Line, which I would argue is probably the largest social media platform that most of us have never heard of. Um, but where should we draw the line? Uh, there are considerations of privacy and ethics that really quickly come into play. Or to put it another way, like, I suspect I'm not the only person here who has sent an absolutely, categorically private message on WhatsApp. And I would be mortified if it was recorded for prosperity. I care about privacy. I'm also Google unique, so for me, privacy online is a whole different ballgame. Anyway, my point is that these snippets that capture the world we live in um, are not just the data about the structures of the virus or the patterns of the spread and contaminations, but they are in some ways an insight, even if a curated and in some ways unrealistic one, uh, into a global shared experience. And we need to consider the lived experience of all of us, whilst maintaining a hyper-awareness that one's lived experience varies immensely from individual to individual, and not just from country to country, or from one socio-economic or ethnic group to another. As we heard from Dr. Dr. Banda, who argued so convincingly this morning, every society has its own knowledge assets, and we have the technology, and we have the technological know-how to link up these assets without forcing the data within them into the same intellectual mold. And as Jenny uh, Fuster noted earlier on today, what we need to do is take deliberate steps to capture and explicitly articulate tacit knowledge. This, of course, is not going to be a, you know, a, a simple task, so please fund my research. Um, thanks, thanks for laughing. Uh, even with the utilization of deep learning, with machine learning and with AI, I really think that we must invest in a comprehensive collection of data and the capture of that data, but also the representation of the information that we pull from that data that is derived in thoughtful ways. So we have seen large-scale computational systems go horribly wrong, such as the Google Photos debacle, or AI being used for recruitment where adverts for CEO positions only went to middle-aged white men. We've also seen it be biased in, when used in, in convictions uh, of, of people in the US. Um, so we know that whilst technology is neither inherently good nor bad per se, it is also clearly not neutral, and neither is the data, nor is the act of data collection. These are all biased, these are all political decisions. Even in the most comprehensive and objective circumstances possible, the thoughtful and careful design of clear underlying data structures that represent different but equally valid knowledge perspectives are an absolute necessity. The combination of even disparate data sets that nevertheless hold complementary information in them, and more to the point, doing so at a vast scale and unprecedented speed, is something that is already technologically possible. Now it's just a matter of doing it now and doing it well. And so, as with any application of technological tools, I. I refuse to just call them technological solutions. Uh, but with the application of any technological tools to a complex human problem space, we need to be extra wary not to succumb to the temptations and the traps of technological determinism or lulling ourselves into this idea that we can just equate something that is technological with being neutral 
and objective, for it is neither. We must also resist the ever-present temptation of editing and structuring the data that we collect to fit the database that we already have. So this, in my opinion, is doing things the wrong way around. It's the way everyone is doing it, but I, yeah, everyone is wrong. That's fine. <coughs> Don't be controversial. Uh, so human information is messy. It's incomplete. It's fuzzy. It's got known knowns. Great, awesome, wonderful. It's got known unknowns. Fantastic, easy to, easy to find that bit. But we can only fearfully guess at all the unknown unknowns that exist out there. Many technological tools will seek to remove inherent ambiguity and uncertainty, but it's in the, it is in the specific capture of that richness, that messiness, that vagueness, and the incorporation of these things into our analysis that we stand the chance to create a comprehensive and honest, cohesive picture of the pandemic situation. And the true effects of the pandemic in the long term will almost certainly only manifest to future generations. Uh, it is our job to provide future scholars with a as comprehensive picture as possible, but not without careful consideration of these challenges of preserving privacy, of the ethical collection, use, storage, and access of the data that we do collect, and the bi-directional flow of trust between data producers and data consumers. And it is of my entirely biased opinion that the methodology that I have chosen to become an expert in, that is to say linked data, is the information publication paradigm of choice. And it should play a central role in our deliberate attempt to combine data sets from different places. And as I've already mentioned, like this technology already exists. The technological know-how to how to use this technology is already here, you know, in this space, in this room with us. So what we now need is this coordinated, collaborative, shared effort and the necessarily, you know, research funding um, to make this happen. And if anyone wants to join me, just so send me your data. Like, I'll do the rest. Thank you very much. And I just had a thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. That was for most entertaining, but also a very profound analysis of the of the problems and the, and I love the messy ambiguity. Me too. I think that's wonderful. I think that's, we need to remember that that we not everything will fit into a slot. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce Scott Stevens, who is the religion and ethics editor for ABC Online and the co-host with Waleed Ali of the Minefield on Radio National. His book on contempt is forthcoming from Melbourne University Press, and he is presenting the 2020 Simone Weil Lecture on Human Value at the Australian Catholic University. Over to you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you all. Uh, I was really thrilled to receive the invitation from Adrian, although he may well uh, wish he didn't after this. Um, I really am thrilled to, to take part. Uh, I, I wasn't entirely sure, though, what role I might play or what contribution I might be able to make to these proceedings. I'm not a historian. I'm not a social scientist or a digital humanities scholar. Uh, I've made my way in the field of, of moral philosophy. Um, and I, I think because of that, some of the particular concerns or questions that I have, or some of the things that stand out for me, are somewhat different from the usual quote unquote ethics concerns surrounding the collection and the storage of data. I think there's a subtle but important difference between the ethics of the data that we collect and what we might call the, the, the moral substance, the moral considerations of the testimony we gather, the testimony we allow to hear, and the testimony we preserve uh, for the future. Um, one of the things I suppose that gives me reason to speak like this is that what I've been tasked to do this year uh, as part of Waleed and I broadcasting the live field each week, is to give real serious consideration to the compound and compounding traumas that have punctuated, that have marked this year as they've happened, to give these events as they overtake us in their partiality 
and in our limited experience, to give these events a kind of moral inflection that refuses to reduce these events either to a curiosity, something to just hold our attention for a certain period of time, or to reduce the events as they happen and the, the experiences of the people as these events overtake them to some kind of ethical principle. In other words, this is a nice illustration of the trolley problem or whatever it might be. For me, the central task of moral philosophy is to cultivate the conditions in which we can be exposed to the moral reality of another person. And in a year like this, what being exposed to their moral reality means is registering the intensity of their expressed experience, their pain, their conviction, their bewilderment, their grief, their sense of injustice, or their sense of injury. And when I say cultivating the conditions, I mean creating an environment in which we can really hear what it is they're trying to say. Now that can, of course, mean that the other person doesn't have to speak at all. It means that the other person can, in fact, remain silent. Sometimes, as we all know, the demand to speak, the demand to give testimony, to make one's pain public, can perpetuate an injustice or intensify a trauma in the same way that silencing a person can. This raises real issues for me. I, I, I'll confess I'm a little less um, certain about the accuracy and the worthwhileness of simply collecting swags of digital data that people have produced and released for publication on social media. Um, to some extent, uh, I think many of these descriptions, many of these expressions of bewilderment, of trauma, of curiosity, of pain, or of the ephemera, or of these little quotidian events, what you might be serving up on the table. These aren't necessarily authentic events. As we all know, anyone who's spent even a few minutes consuming Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, you know that oftentimes people aren't themselves, people are acting like themselves. People are cultivating a particular version of themselves that they want to then project onto the world. I guess I, would, I have very, very real concerns with uh, taking uh, what is simply produced as a kind of benchmark necessarily, or even uh, an accurate data set that captures the trauma of what it's been like to live through the compound, compounding crises of 2020. It seems to me that one of the crucial things, one of the crucial moral tests in the collection of testimony, and I'll come back to that term in just a moment, in the collection of testimony is that that collection needs to come out of a commitment to be attentive to the words as spoken that the other person is willing to give. I don't think, therefore, that we should necessarily presume uh, the fact of or the reality of the giving of consent just because from social media. So along these lines, I'd just like to contribute maybe a couple of cautionary warnings. Uh, um, of some of the dangers surrounding documenting traumas, experiences of this year. The first thing I think I'd want to point out is that 2020 has left us with no shortage of representation of the experience of this year. Between the ubiquity of the smartphone and the availability of social media on the one hand and the insatiable appetite of the mainstream media on the other, we are experiencing what could be called expressive abundance. We have lots and lots of recorded, published, circulated expressions of what it's been like to live through this year. Should this be taken as being testimony of trauma or accurate testimony of the experiences of this year? You could say, like I said before, the very act of recording a moment or experience, however brave, say uh, the experience of uh, of being with another person at the end of their life, but only by Skype or by Zoom, or quotidian, like putting a fairly boring meal on the table and Snapchatting. Uh, you could say that the very act of recording and sharing it or supplying it to the media implies a degree of consent, but I'm not sure that it does. Not just because maybe the moment that someone posts that they don't expect that moment to last into perpetuity or to be reflected on in further, uh, for further generations. Rather, I'm not sure that these things reach the moral level of consent that we would often expect 
out of events or years such as this. But what legitimates the act of giving consent, uh, as the philosopher Simone Weil recognized, is that consent isn't sought for the sake of anything else. Consent isn't a barrier that needs to be gotten around. Rather, consent is an act or form even of love. It's a way of communicating to another person, I want to listen, I'm trying to hear you, I want to understand, and I'm willing to wait until you are ready. And I think for precisely that reason, if what it is that an initiative such as documenting the multiple traumas of 2020, if this is supposed to reach a certain moral level, then I think we need to avoid two very real temptations. One would be the temptation of history. Namely, all of these things are just bits and pieces, the little moments along the way that they might have expressed a certain trauma, a certain pain, an isolation or loneliness. But we know from the perspective of the end of 2020 that these are just pinpricks. These are blips along the way that will be clear being planned, a vaccine being produced, a vaccine being distributed, uh, and then we can see these as part of the texture, part of the little ornaments or trinkets that littered 2020. I think the other real temptation, though, is to see these individual moments where people have tried to express their pain, their concern, their isolation, their loneliness, their uncertainty, their bewilderment, their experience of injustice, to see these things simply as ephemera, simply as things that have been put out in order to be momentarily consumed and then forgotten. These things really do register, I think, part of the moral texture of people's lives as they lived. What is important for those who want to archive, who want to document these experiences, is then to ensure that the proper degree of consent has, in fact, uh, been gained. And I think what that has to be is a non-reliance purely on data, but it really does have to mean the slow, patient eliciting of what really does come up to the moral category of testimony where trust has been gotten, trust has been gained. The words that are spoken are then reported and reported as an act of love. But I mean, the other thing that needs to be kept in mind is the context in which these events have taken place. That it's not just one trauma, it's not just one series of events that goes by the name of COVID-19 or pandemic that we're looking at, but rather a broader experience, a series of compound and compounding traumas that's why, for instance, I've taken to thinking about 2020 as a year in which we have experienced multiple crises of breathing, multiple afflictions of the air, beginning with the bushfires, moving through the worldwide reckoning with the racial, the legacy of racial cruelty and contempt that was occasioned by the suffocation of a 46-year-old black man, right through uh, to the, I think we need to call this the, the obscene discrimination with which people with which people groups who have long been the targets of discriminatory laws and, uh, and policing uh, have now themselves uh, been uh, um, the victims of COVID-19 with a kind of obscene discrimination. So I think the moral task that needs to be kept in mind after trying to uh, um, get a proper sense of the traumas, the multiple traumas of 2020 uh, is both to ensure that what we record uh, does in fact stand up to, does in fact reach the moral level of testimony, uh, where words are given in order to be heard, uh, in order to be truly registered and not for some ulterior motive, but also that the way that we record this takes account, I think, of the broader political, environmental, and social context already littered with the rubble, the ruins of multiple inequalities and injustices. Uh, and to see what has happened this year, the way we've experienced it, as taking place in that landscape. And so giving that broader sense of COVID-19 being experienced off the back of a series of already existing injustices and isolations. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was the most profound reflection on how we do reach that moral level where something does become testimony rather than just a series of random incidents posted at impulsive moments of time. A very timely reminder, we need to have that, that level of care. 
Thank you very much for your contribution. And now I'd like to call on Jay Weatherburn, the Program Manager at Digital Preservation at the University of Melbourne, where she is involved in implementing a 10-year digital preservation strategy. She is also head of the Australasia and Asia Pacific with the Digital Preservation Coalition. Um, over to you, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Roz, for the introduction. And thank you to the National Archives of Australia and the UNESCO Memory of the World Program for the opportunity to speak in this forum. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to elders past and present. I've approached this topic of challenges and opportunities for digital preservation and data archiving by firstly articulating some digital preservation challenges and ones that may well come under increasing pressure in a post COVID-19 world and then by raising some opportunities, which are all highly relevant to how we go about digitally archiving and preserving COVID-19 and other momentous societal events. Firstly, on challenges for long-term digital preservation, we know that the scale and the complexity of digital materials is increasing. There's rapidly changing technology that can become obsolete uh, in a matter of years. Uh, digital materials are increasingly ephemeral. Some are created and hosted online or in commercial platforms that have no business incentive to aid archiving and preservation efforts. Many diverse skills are required that need continuous development, appraisal and selection skills, policy writing skills, technical skills, curation skills, advocacy and communication skills. And we know that also digital preservation comes with a cost. There is constant need to advocate for ongoing and adequate resourcing. Not least as well, there is a growing cost on our natural environment to consider as we use more processing power and more storage is required. We have a duty to consider the impacts of our work on the sustainability of our planet and realize that we can't keep everything that we're creating. So how do we ensure that we have sufficiently diverse representative snapshots? There are great opportunities that we can engage with, particularly in relation to ensuring diverse and collaborative approaches to digital preservation. The pandemic and other ongoing significant societal events have brought about increasingly participatory models for documenting and collecting diverse experiences. Archival activism involves community-led, community-centered archiving initiatives that are increasingly utilizing digital technology. Archival activism is often seen with movements such as Black Lives Matter, where the community-led approach is addressing gaps in traditional archiving approaches and driving questions around the changing role of memory institutions. These questions are relevant for consideration for documenting diverse experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are ethical practices that can be observed through archival activism efforts. Documenting the now for example, develops tools and practices that support ethical collection and preservation of social media content. In Ireland, there's the Black and Irish social media community as an example of communities who are doing memory work, providing spaces where people can share their experiences of growing up Black in Ireland. And they are making the decisions about how their stories are collected and shared. The opportunity exists for us to explore and to contribute our skills to more of these self-curated and collaboratively developed digital archiving practices for documenting and preserving voices and experiences of COVID-19, especially those that may not be heard using more traditional archiving approaches. We have a role to play in guiding and educating more widely about the the complexities and the requirements of digital documenting and sustainability practices that can help ensure a more diverse historical record to avoid the risk of monocultural approaches and the, 
the tunnel vision that can result from collecting at a distance that Lauren Carroll Harris so thoughtfully outlined earlier, we need to be meeting communities where they are, letting them lead and being accountable to them. A challenge here that is important to note, however, is that digital sustainability is often an afterthought when designing and launching, especially rapid response digital collecting projects. This is especially of concern when digital collecting is resourced through project funding that is finite or where resourcing is non-existent, as is likely to be the case when documenting diverse experiences using readily available technology during society changing events. If digital collecting projects are created and hosted outside of traditional memory keeping institutions, and they have no digital archiving expertise, expert knowledge or help, then how are they gonna be preserved for posterity? Another, another um, opportunity we have as information professionals is to spread awareness about the importance of planning for sustainability of digital collections from the point of creation. The socio-technical sustainability roadmap developed at the University of Pittsburgh is one example of a resource that helps projects plan for both the technical infrastructure required and the often more complex social organization and resourcing that is required to support ongoing digital sustainability of collections. So allow me now to turn our focus to data archiving. During the pandemic, a lot of data has been generated and models created from input data that are used by health experts and governments to make major decisions that have impacts on society, uh, as Dr. Brendan Murphy outlined for us earlier. These data and models are generated by interdisciplinary teams, including epidemiologists, computational modelers, social scientists, and clinicians. The importance of documenting those data and models and clinical trials is amplified, particularly in this post-truth era. Any question about the authenticity of how various data we use to make major societal decisions or any room for doubt about how vaccines were made and tested allows for distrust of the process potentially allowing uh, disruptive activities to gain evidence and attention, such as anti-vaccination movements. Dr. Anthea Hislop mentioned earlier the absolute goldmine collection at the National Archives of telegrams and letters that help historians make sense of government decisions. Today's governments communicate using digital technology, using email and instant messaging applications. Taking the UK as an example, the government's response to COVID-19 is recorded in WhatsApp and text messages between ministers and officials. This has prompted the Digital Preservation Coalition President Richard Ovenden to submit a letter to the government seeking reassurance that government departments have measures in place to capture and document such digital correspondence so that it is preserved under the Public Records Act. But the reality of documenting and organizing digital data is that it is time consuming and it requires specialist skills and knowledge. It demands investment. If documentation of data is not done in collaboration with or by the content creators who fully understand how and why the data were created and used, context and understanding can be lost. Authenticity for that data can be lost. A challenge is that research teams cannot suddenly overnight become experts in digital data management or experts in archiving and preserving data. There is a clear need for information professionals to be able to better collaborate with research teams to ensure that documentation of data. To meet this need, data stewardship capacity has begun to appear Data stewardship aims to grow the skills and to grow the expert partnerships required, including researchers, including data scientists embedded in research projects and data stewards 
who have expertise in how to ensure that data can be made findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable. There's still many challenges in sharing data, one being that we don't have universal standards for documenting and for disseminating data across disciplinary fields. During the pandemic, the Research Data Alliance coordinated a cross-disciplinary initiative aiming to develop a systemic approach for data sharing in public health emergencies. This work produced recommendations and guidelines, some of which when implemented will directly benefit the more downstream processes of data archiving and data preservation. Finally, I think that encouraging more collaborative approaches to shared challenges is perhaps one of the biggest opportunities that we have. In our Australasian region, the Australasia Preserves Digital Preservation Community of Practice brings together professional fields of interest who have a stake in long-term digital preservation. Archivists, librarians, record keepers, IT professionals, data managers, those working in government and corporate information management settings. This forum allows sharing of expertise and knowledge and learning from different approaches being taken for digital archiving and preservation. This year also saw the establishment of a digital preservation coalition base in Australasia. The DPC is an international not-for-profit membership organization dedicated to improving digital preservation capability by providing advocacy, by providing community engagement through skills and workforce development and standards and good practice through its work program. And it offers many opportunities to further help open conversations and explore partnerships and to broadly educate about the value of investing time and energy into digital sustainability. We have these intersectoral forums and we have these networks now that can contribute to national and international discussions and to explore models of collaboration, especially when seeking to avoid duplication of effort for our shared challenges. We all need digital storage for our digital assets. We all need a diverse and skilled and capable workforce. And we all need more resourcing to do this essential work that goes into sustaining our increasingly digital memory for future generations. So I hope this has provided some interesting additions to what has been a really great day of learning about documenting COVID-19 in Australia. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jane. That's, that's a very interesting and, and challenging um, issue of how we sustain the digital heritage that's being created so massively. And we'll deal with that for a bit later on. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, finally, we've come to our final discussion session uh, for the day. Uh, there are, is one question on the, on the screen. Uh, and I might take that first before I ask for anything from the room. It's for Dr. Dan Angus. And did you create your own digital archival tools or did you use open source tools such as Document Now? And there's a URL for that. So a question yep. for Dan. So we, we use a collection of different tools in collecting data in various forms. So we publish open source tools and use other um, APIs that are published by platforms themselves. So the, for the Twitter work, we mostly use the, um, the Twitter API that they provide and a series of tools that are developed in-house to then manage that data, um, various forms of databases and other then tools to provide to researchers to make sense of what's going on there. Um, so I guess, yeah, in answering a, a mishmash of, of lots of different tools. Thank you, Daniel, for that uh, response. And there's another question. I might take that now, if I may. Uh, following on from Scott Stevens' excellent talk and read the COVID collecting efforts about uh, memory institutions, why the urgency and for whom? Wow, is that one for me, is it? <laughs> we don't know. Or, okay. Uh, um, look, I, I do think the question of, of urgency, and I'm really glad it was put that way. Uh, I do think we, you know, 
I don't want to be too grumpy about this, but I do to get, tend to get really, really grumpy whenever it comes to these kinds of topics. Um, I do think that the digital world in which we increasingly find our social and civic habitation uh, has led us to expect a degree of concreteness, a degree of immediacy, and the ability to reach for things that ought to take time in order to be done well and to achieve a certain moral standard. Uh, we've come to reach, we, we've come to expect that these things can be done much too quickly. And as a result, uh, a certain data set can be used uh, to give a partial result when the time uh, and the care that Jay was speaking about just a moment ago to do these things well, I don't, I don't think they can't be done digitally, but in order to be done digitally, there is a degree of time taking, there is a degree of trust uh, conferring and trust granting that needs to be achieved. And I think more than anything else, I, I guess I'm also wondering, especially if we think about the intersection between COVID uh, and certain social, civic, racial tensions that have also exploded this year, uh, the kinds of intermediaries that now need to be involved as go between, between archivists, between the people who are doing the documenting, the recording, the preservation, uh, and the work that needs to be done on the ground, the people who are able to give testimony about what it really has been like, for instance, to be confined in the North Melbourne Towers, what it really has been like, for instance, to have one's loved one to go through uh, their death in utter isolation in a for-profit aged care facility. And so I think we should never, ever, ever sacrifice time in order to get something quickly and to allow the, uh, the factors that are involved in the social media companies end of the equation, namely the disappearance of this data, uh, to, to give us permission, if you like, to take the short, the, the, the side steps, the shortcuts, uh, in getting what really could be, I think, a crucial set of testimony uh, that gives an accurate pic picture of what the compound and compounding crises of this year have been like. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the room at this point? Um, Rachel. At this point, I'd like to make an observation. Uh, we seem to have Dan and Turkey who are here looking at Look at all amazing things we can do with the aggregated data that we can collect. And we've got uh, Scott and Jay who are sort of saying, there is a thing here, and Dan used the term before, the, the right to be forgotten, the European court ruling on the right to be forgotten. Hmm. There seems to be some tension between these two ideas of using this data that we've got versus do we have the right to use this data that we've got? Has it been put out there for use or has it just been put out as a personal expression? Um, I sense tension, and I would just like to see if anyone has any thoughts on the panel that they'd like to uh, to bring to that. All right, great. I got stared at, so I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> um, no, no, I don't. Okay, so first of all, I don't think there's anything wrong with tension. Like otherwise, we're just in an echo chamber where everyone nods and you know pats each other on the back, and you know tension can be really good. Um, it's good to have critical evaluation of any research agenda. Um, or topic so as to kind of tease out any problems or challenges that might be there. So I don't think avoiding tension is necessarily the way to go. This might be controversial in Australia because everyone I've met in Australia has been lovely. So, um, As a European Union citizen, I feel very strongly in favour of things like the right to be forgotten, I think, as this, you know, the EU would make the right decision. As someone who is Google unique, which means that everything I put online and have been putting online since I was 13, so that's about you know, <clears throat> 20 or so years, we'll go with 20, uh, of me putting stuff online before I became aware of the possibility that someone might want to look at that and record that and use that for analysis. I think I have a, a hyper awareness as to the, 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 the possible ethical considerations and issues of privacy that might, might come into play. I, I think when we look at social media, it's a very different sort of space. But then also, historically, we have become accustomed to accepting it. It's completely normal to have a a PhD or have an entire career studying someone's personal correspondences, people's diaries, um, they were probably not written at any point in time intended to be the focus of international study and interest. 
but here we are. Um, at least with social media, you have some degree of self-curation and choice. I mean, I know that people use other social media platforms for their research. I am often limited to places like Twitter and Reddit because they are considered to be more open, more public. So not something like Facebook, where you would have to be personal friends with the user to have access to their data. But Twitter, which is slightly more like standing on a soapbox in, in Hyde Park and shouting your opinions into the void. Um, and so there, I think there are lots of different, very complex considerations at play. I guess I'll leave it. Thank you, Tim. Any other responses to? No, just jump in for a sec. Um, I, I take the point and um, Scott's point as well is something that I entirely agree with. Um, and I guess, you know, this dichotomy that's being pointed out of like, we're just there kind of collecting all this data at one end, and I'm kind of just hoovering up everything for no real purpose. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I think we are guided through notions of testimony, like what Scott has put out there, um, and, are, and are quite strategic in what we do curate. Um, part of the effort of what I was talking about today is very much trying to, I guess, create an archive, and much of the data that exists within that might never, ever really be used or seen. But to have it there as a record that one day, if under the particular circumstances we deem it necessary to go back and look at that, then there is the option there at least to do that. But obviously under strict kind of moral guidance um, around you know, what that kind of research might look like. Um, but I just want to draw in a, a third point around this, which is coming back to a project we're working on at the moment with Instagram data. Um, and what this project does is link from both ends. It's getting the testimony from um, users of the platform on the ground, largely youth cultures. Um, and then it's also doing the aggregate work, looking at hashtags and particular geotags being used at things like music festivals. But what it's showing is that you kind of sometimes need both to understand, in this case, we're interested in the hidden algorithms of platforms like Instagram, the machine vision algorithms they're using to curate and make sense of our, of our messy world. And you really need to kind of do both to be able to unpack and understand how platforms are intervening in our lived experience, what um, Strifus and, and many others will call the algorithmic culture that's being created at the moment. So the algorithms that are deciding what we see within our news feeds and how that data is treated within their platforms and kind of made visible. And so we are doing both. We're getting that testimony, that authentic testimony from those individuals who are using the platform and sharing their, their photos, but we're also doing the aggregate work to understand that, that you know, in general, what's happening across a, a wider population. Could I just add just one very, very brief point on, on that? And then I promise I'll, I'll shut up. Um, I guess I, I would simply want to hold out a degree of modesty that one of the commitments that comes out of an initiative like this is that we don't fool ourselves into thinking that we have more data than we actually have. I think one of the things that, uh, that algorithms and the sheer amount of what I called before, kind of expressive abundance, it lures us into the idea that we have all this stuff, we have this wonderful cross-section of so many people, but due to a number of inequities, of biases uh, that are built into the use of these platforms themselves, plus the way that people use them, that maybe what's being produced when a particular Instagram uh, uh, um, uh, image or, or post is being used doesn't actually suggest what you think it does or what we think it does, or maybe what the algorithm believes it does. I know that algorithms don't believe. So I would just say that maybe we need a little, little bit more modesty that we don't have as much information as we actually have. Uh, and that a very good amount of, of in-person human information uh, testimony may well be needed to get anything like uh, a full, much less a reasonable picture. Um, any more questions from the room? Shane. Um, yeah, I guess, sorry, um, perhaps a reflection or question, sorry. Um, but Scott, I was very um, inspired by your um, ethical and philosophical assessment of um, different types of testimony, I guess, I would see um, social media commentary 
versus perhaps more a delayed, more considered slow burn um, testimony. And I, I wonder, thinking about linkages between data, um, whether perhaps um, a, a more important field or an equally important field for us to be thinking about today is the dynamic that might be happening between um, more immediate social media pr proliferating expressions, as you call them, I think, and that longer term testimony. Because I'm, I'm wondering perhaps if um, that delayed, slow cooked testimony is untouched, in fact, by uh, what's Fair happening answer. on social media platforms. Is that something you might reflect on for us? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, can we just all acknowledge that what you've rightly called kind of slow burn, more considered testimony, am I allowed to say this? I mean, that, that can also be, that's another way of saying bullshit. Um, uh, sometimes testimony, the further it gets from the event, can become of various forms of self-manicuring, self-production of the kind that we often see on social media. So I'm not saying that testimony that takes a long time to articulate is necessarily more credible. Sometimes the further you get from the event, uh, the more deceptive it is, in fact, is, the more self-deceptive it is. So I do think there is a great value in capturing something in the moment as it happens. I guess the real problem is these things that are being captured in the moment, they are swimming in this sea of self-production and self-manufactured, um, uh, uh, I have it togetherness uh, that really needs to be teased apart. So I think the way to you, for, I would really want to add anything more to the question than to say, yes, absolutely. Um, I think the really great testifiers, the people whose testimony we want to get, we want to try to record, and this is why it needs to be cultivated over time, uh, is, uh, is those who have actually, is the testimony of those who really have held on to something authentic and deep, which means emotive and partial, uh, uncertain uh, about what the original event was in fact like. So yes, you, you've got a great big thumbs up from me. No more questions online. Any more questions from the room? In that case, I will hand over. Thank, thank, first of all, thank all the panel members very much for your contributions. They've been amazingly thought-provoking and give us lots to go away with and, and wrestle with as in the days and weeks ahead. Um, thank you, Chehi, and all of those on Jay, Dan, and Scott, all online. And uh, thank you to the audience for your questions as well. And it's my pleasure now to hand over back to Adrian Cunningham. So we're in the Homewood Strait. Uh, I have about 10 minutes before we have to conclude proceedings to, to try the unenviable task of wrapping up um, and summarising learnings from today and, and in particular to look at um, what actions we might want to identify um, as takeaways from, from today. But uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of the speakers. We've had a tremendous smorgasbord of um, reportage about what's happening in terms of documenting the COVID-19 pandemic right now, and, and that's been amazingly stimulating and informative. But we've also had the opportunity from a variety of speakers who've questioned and tries to tease out um, what on earth we're doing here, are we doing it the right way, could we be doing it better. Um, so yes, there's, there's lots of opportunities for documentation and we, we, I love that phrase, um, the expressive abundance. You know, we're, we're living in, a, in an ever expanding ocean of data of, of information that's out there um, that potentially could be captured and preserved um, as evidence of the COVID-19 experience in Australia. Um, but are we getting the right stuff? Um, how do we know in that ocean of expression, expressive abundance, what is particularly valuable in terms of providing 
authentic testimony of, uh, of the real experience, if there is such a thing, of, of the pandemic in this country at this time. Look, there, there, there are no easy answers to any of these things, but the exciting thing about today is um, we've been prepared to ask and tease out some of these really difficult questions. And what's also exciting is, OK, it's not, it's not like COVID-19 is the only topic to which these difficult questions can be applied. They apply across the board. COVID-19 is just a window into the challenges that we're faced with in, in documenting Australian society. And um, it's tempting at one level when faced with all of these really difficult questions to just throw up your hands and say, oh, it's all too hard. Um, <laughs> I can't do it, I'd rather just hide under the doona. Um, but no, um, as practitioners and pro professionals in this field, we, we have to acknowledge that yes, it's hard, there are no easy answers, we're, that we're never going to achieve perfection in our efforts, but we, it behooves us to, to try our level best um, and be open always to contestation, to questioning, um, etc. Et so with all of that said, what what I'd like to get a sense of now is uh, from from the room, but 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 also from uh, the online participants. Of okay, we've heard a lot about what we're doing. Um, some of it you may be very happy with. Some of it you may have questions about. Um, I'd like to get a sense from people as to what we're missing out on um, at one level. You know, uh, we heard um, earlier this morning about potentially some of the um, undocumented uh, aspects of uh, the COVID-19 experience in this country that um, perhaps we could be doing a better job of targeting. And I'd also like to hear about, do people have views as to um, how we can, what methodologies can we bring to bear to determine out of all of this ocean of um, expressive abundance, how can we make decisions about um, what documentary sources uh, provide the most useful windows into the reality of the COVID-19 experience in this country? Because, harking back to what I said earlier, we can't keep everything, we do have to make hard choices. Um, yeah, all of this stuff is evidence of something, but how valuable is that evidence is the, is the hard question. And, and as Scott Stevens has said, we have to be mindful not just of the ethical considerations associated with scooping up and preserving all this stuff, but there's a whole moral universe there as well, which is um, a real minefield potentially. And, and, and yeah, we're, going to, we're probably going to step on the odd... Um, landmine, but we have to walk across the minefield, and we have no we have no choice but to get our hands dirty in this in, in this difficult endeavour. And but it's a good start to be at least aware of um, um, of the difficulties and the dilemmas that that are that are there. Um, so, um, does anyone have any? suggestions um, that, they can, that they can share with us about gaps, um, problems, uh, etc. Yes, one in the room. So. Stephen Fox from the National Archives. Um, it's already been raised, but it needs to be recognised and recorded, and that's, that's the First Nations position. I mean, there's, there hasn't been any any input in this conversation from that perspective, and it's not for us to say, but, but there's a serious piece of engagement that needs to happen in that, in that space. So I guess I'm just really acknowledging yep. that. Yep. Is, yep. Is an and it's a large and important and complex body of work, but we need to, as you say, not hide, hide under the doona, we need to actually um, start talking in that space. Yep, yep. Yes, um, thanks, Stephen. So, I mean, at one level, um, you know, we could ask people like IATSIS, um, what are they doing? Um, that's, that's one institutional voice that's been absent from today's program. Um, but, um, but I think you know, reaching out to Indigenous communities and Indigenous representatives through whatever channels 
are at our disposal is something we, we must do. And, 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 and when I say we, it's, this is not just the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee. I think it, it probably that responsibility rests with everyone who's pursuing initiatives in this area. It, it, each institution, each program um, has that responsibility to be mindful of the Indigenous um, aspects. So that's, that's certainly a good start. Um, Scott, if you're still there, um, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts about, um, you know, you clearly have views as to what testimonies have more value than others um, and, and have more moral legitimacy perhaps than others. Um, can you give us some, if you're still there, can you give us some actual examples of, of things that would tick a few boxes for us? Maybe he's, maybe he's not there. And, and look, I, I should... He's gone. he's gone, OK. And look, I should thank Scott because he's actually on a family holiday this week. Um, so he, he, um, he joined us. He took time away from um, what's no doubt a much-needed rest to, to join us today, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I might follow up with him on, on email because he had some very cogent observations. Um, we've got a, a few minutes left, but uh, any other thoughts? Is there anything coming in from the... From the uh, no? 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 <laughs> I'm, what I'm also sensing is perhaps we've given people more food for thought than they probably anticipated out of today, which is great. You know, I know my head's kind of spinning, um, but that, but in a good way. I think I think what it's what today has demonstrated is yeah, there's practitioners are not hiding under the doona. They are getting out there doing things and and trying to grab stuff before it disappears, and that's good. Um, Today we've had the chance to consider, yes, there might be some gaps that some of us might need to try and fill, and, and through the coordination mechanism of the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee, we can, we can try and tackle that. Um, um, but I think we've also been asked some hard questions about value, morality, ethics, privacy. Uh, I mean, one of the questions I've got is, you know, with a lot of this social media data, for example, that is being captured, um, okay, clearly there's a privacy issue with revealing that name identified data um, right now uh, without informed consent. Um, but in 50 years' time, when people are no longer with us, um, you know, does, does this stuff have a, a date by which um, some of those moral and ethical questions if not disappear, at least get sufficiently ameliorated that it becomes less problematic for us um, from, from a, a moral perspective. I don't know, but there, there, are, there are questions that we should be asking ourselves. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of technology there that can mine this stuff, and we've got the promise of artificial intelligence. We have the converse challenge of digital preservation and, and preserving all of this data meaningfully over time, given the vicissitudes of technological change, etc. And so uh, there's plenty of work to keep practitioners in this field extremely busy for a, a very long time to come. Um, um, that's reassuring, but it's also really scary as well. So, um, look, I think it, um, with having said all of that, um, I'll now hand back to Roz to, um, to, to close down the event for, for the day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Adrian. What a day it's been. It's been a remarkable a range of speakers. And thank you profoundly to every one of you for your, con your very considered and thoughtful contributions to the um, topic. It's been illuminating. As Adrian says, my head is spinning as well um, to processing all that information. But I think over the coming days, we'll start to see some contours around this subject that we can uh, put down into a plan of action. Uh, Thanks again to National Archives of Australia, to the team who have been so marvellous all day long. Uh, technicians, I can't name you all, I'm sorry, but to Tale and to Johanna and to, especially to uh, National, uh, the, the Director General of National Archives of Australia, uh, 
David Fricker, who's not in the room at the moment, and also to Stephen Fox and Louise Doyle, who has been here all day as well. Um, every one of you has been a tower of strength for us, and we can't be more grateful for the contribution National Archives have made. To all those people from other institutions, most of whom have gone off to do other things, uh, thank you to you as well if, you, if you're listening or watching this later on. Uh, but it's my pleasant duty now to um, wrap up the meeting. I think we've had a great day, and I'm sure that many of us will take home many ideas that hadn't occurred to us before uh, to ponder on as we continue to discuss this, this subject within the context of the broader uh, mission of documenting Australian society. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>